So in this video, I want to look at a model that I stumbled upon when I was looking at the Vicuna details and looking at the different weights and stuff that have come out for that. And this is the model called Koala. So this is a very interesting model. So Koala is a dialogue model for academic research. And the diagram here shows us what it is. Not surprisingly, it's built on Llama, right? Very common to see lately. And what they've done is basically train it on two sorts of data sets to create Koala. So these are supervised fine-tuning data sets that are dialogue-based, and they fall into two categories. One category that they're calling distillation data, meaning that this is the stuff that was created by another model. And that's generally that model is going to be ChatGPT. And then the other one is open source data, which is actual human created data in here. So they sort of show that like doing this training and they're collecting not just one data set, they're collecting a number of data sets, which we'll look at in a second. This basically can respond to a variety of user queries, generating responses that are often preferred over Alpaca and at least tied with ChatGPT in over half of the cases. So that's a big statement to make there. And they've actually done some really nice evaluation to back it up, as we will see when we go through this post. So let's look at the sort of details. It's trained on Llama. It's got these data sets. And they make some really nice comments in here about the relative performance of large closed source models to smaller public models. And they make the point that perhaps really what we should be going for here is that models that are small enough to run on locally and capture much of the performance of their larger models, if trained on carefully sourced data. So that's a big thing. And what they're showing is that probably the community should put more effort into curating high quality data sets. And that's sort of one of the key takeaways of this whole koala model and blog post, etc. So let's sort of jump in and have a look at what they've done. They propose this new model called Koala, and they show that it's been trained on data scraped from the web, but with a specific focus on conversational data. So that includes stuff from things like ChatGPT, but it also includes other things as well that are public data sets. And they point out that by getting the right data, we can actually mitigate a lot of the shortcomings of having a smaller model. Now, I would say that one of the reasons this works is because the Llama model is actually trained on a trillion tokens there. So that's something that makes this really interesting as well. So let's look at what they've done. So we've got Alpaca, which basically had training code and public weights, but wasn't dialogue fine-tuned. And the evaluations were quite small. The ChatGPT obviously is not public at all. We don't have training code. We don't have public weights, but it is dialogue fine-tuned. And we don't really know the evaluation methods that OpenAI is used to create it. And then we've got Koala. So this is basically the training set of public dialogues and preferences. Got training code, got public weights, at least deltas for the weights. And we've got a dialogue fine-tuned. And this has been evaluated by a hundred different humans. So they're actually using Mechanical Turk there to use a group of people to do evaluations. I'll talk about that in a second. So let's look at the data set and training. The key thing here is that their idea of basically curating set of data sets, and it's not just one data set here. There's a number of these that they're putting together. Rather than maximizing the quantity by scraping as much of the web as possible, which is what a lot of people have done before, they focus on collecting high quality, small data sets in here. And they look for a mixture of question answering, human feedback, and dialogues with existing large language models. So let's look at these actual data sets. So the first one is the chat GPT distillation data. So this actually comes from share GPT, which we looked at in the previous video for training the Vicuna model. And we can see that they had around 60K dialogues shared by users on ShareGPT. After deduplication, removing non-English, stuff like that, they're left with 30,000 examples. Now, I should stress that the 30,000 examples here sounds like that it's a lot less than something like the Alpaca data set, which had 50,000 examples. But one of the key thing differences here is that the Alpaca data set 
I think it's 96% of that would fit just in 256 tokens. And they only trained on 512 tokens for the actual alpaca model. With this, they're actually collecting much longer examples. So the examples go right out to sort of 2000 tokens. So while it's a smaller number of examples, overall combined, it's probably a lot more data actually in there if we counted the number of tokens. They've also got the human ChatGPT corpus, which has been released. So this basically has an English data set, 60,000 human answers, 27,000 ChatGPT answers for around 24,000 questions. So that gives us a lot of data there. So that's like another 87,000 question answer examples. They then look at some of the other data that's available out there. This open instruction generalist data set or parts of it from Lion. And this is really interesting. So this has GSM instructions or grade school math instructions. It has poetry to songs, and it has this idea of plot, screenplay, books, dialogue data set there. Altogether, that's th another 30,000 examples. They then combine with the alpaca data set, which gives them another 52,000 examples. They then use the anthropic data set. So remember, anthropic are the people who created the Claude model. They still release some papers. They released a data set for one of their papers. They've used that in here. And then finally, when OpenAI still used to release papers, they would occasionally use release data sets. And that's what they've used here. So we've got the data set from the OpenAI web GPT, and that's around 20,000 examples. And we've got the data set from the OpenAI summarization, which is around 93,000 examples. I'm pretty sure from memory, this particular paper was one of the first papers where OpenAI showed using, along with InstructGPT, was one of the first ones where they're using RLHF in there. So that's something that, you know, it's kind of interesting if they're using that data set as well. So you can see they've got a lot of different data sets, but they're all dialogue based, which really shows when we look at the model afterwards to see how it actually comes together. They've also got some really interesting things in about how they train the model. So they've used Jax and Flax for training this. So at some point I want to make some actual tutorials about uh, Jax and Flax and the advantages of training models with this. They've made their own little framework called EasyLM, which allows them to do basically pre-training, fine-tuning, serving, and evaluations. They trained this on a NVIDIA DGX server with eight A100s, and they said it takes about six hours to do a complete training for two epochs there. So two epochs less than what Alpaca did. Alpaca was trained for three epochs there. And they claim that, okay, you should be able to do this for $100 or less with preemptible instances on public cloud. Let's look at the evaluation. So the evaluation is very interesting. So in one of the previous videos, I mentioned the concept of mean opinion scores that people used to use for and still use for text-to-speech models. And the idea is there that you would have two examples and you would sort of have a human choose which one sounded better. And one might be a real person, one might be a text-to-speech there. They're basically doing the same thing here by presenting two examples and having the user pick which one they prefer. So we can see that when they're competing against the alpaca data set, this koala all it looks like it's chosen this amount of times, roughly 50%. It's tied probably another 20%, and then it loses or is worse for this sort of maybe 30% that's left over. You can see they do the same for koala distill. So let me explain what the koala distill versus koala all is. So koala distill is only trained on the distillation data, meaning that it's only trained on the data that comes out of ChatGPT. Whereas Koala All is trained on the data sets that are distillation data sets from ChatGPT, but also from humans. So you would expect to think that, okay, it, that's going to be a bit better. And it, it looks like maybe it is, maybe not, right? They're very close. We can see here that competing against the Koala Distill, it's probably actually a little worse off with this. And then it sort of ties. And then we've got, you know, where it's actually worse than this. So that's kind of interesting to look at. And then finally look at comparing to ChatGPT itself, we can see that, okay, above 
50% of the time, people either think that Koala all is better or it ties with ChatGPT. And remember, of course, we could say the flip of that as well, but this is interesting. It certainly shows that this model is generating good results out. And they actually talk about how they did this. And this is where I was talking about the sort of scoring. So they used Amazon's Mechanical Turk platform and they basically present these to people and they have a hundred evaluators and those hundred evaluators pick which is better and they don't know which one is which. So they do it on two test sets. They've got the koala test set and they've got the alpaca test set and they use those for comparison. So we can see that the model is definitely doing quite well in that way. They also show an interesting thing in here that the dialogues, the ChatGPT dialogues are of such high quality that incorporating even twice as much open source data did not lead to a significant improvement. So it does show that the distillation is pretty good. If we can distill from ChatGPT, which obviously is probably not, we're not allowed to do that legally, or we're not allowed to do that for commercial to build something that competes with an open AI model. I'm not going to get into the legal issues in here. There's a lot of interesting things going on in the legal things. And I've seen people write cases in the comments, which is very interesting. Unfortunately, a lot of this stuff just hasn't been tested in the courts. So we don't know whether this will stand up or whether it won't. It will really depend. But you certainly shouldn't be using this for commercial stuff. That's what I would say currently. The limitations and safety. No surprise, the koala hallucinates, just like every other language model. It has biases and stereotypes from the training data. It has a lack of common sense. It's not AGI, all right? We can see that the, what they've released is some really nice stuff. They've got the demo, which I'll go through in a second. They've released the Easy LM, and they've got the deltas or the model weights diff against the base Llama model. So if you've got the base Llama model, we can basically take these new weights and then generate the weights for the Koala model. And perhaps I'll look at doing that in the future for one of these. They talk about the license. So this is basically for research preview. It's intended for academic research. They point out the license of Llama forbids it from being commercial. The terms of use from OpenAI forbid it from being used for this. And the privacy practices of shared GPT forbid it. Like I said, the idea here is this is not for commercial stuff. So then they propose some things for the future. Definitely come in and have a read of the full blog post. This is the Easy LM repo. And perhaps we can look at this in the future if people are interested. It only supports a subset of the Hugging Face. So at the moment, it just supports Llama, GPT-J, OPT models, and Roberta. You can see they've got a thing about Koala in here. And they've actually put a whole doc about how to getting the weight diff. I presume this is supposed to be weight diff uh, in here. And then basically how to even convert it to a hugging face checkpoint in here as well. So it's got that. If you're interested in another project that you could look at is the Lion AI open assistant. So this is the whole idea of building a data set. Maybe this probably deserves a whole video by itself. So maybe I'll come back and look at these two things. Let's jump in and look at the actual model and play with the outputs and see what it looks like itself. Okay, let's look at some of the generation. So I actually recorded this part already and the audio didn't work out. So I'm actually reusing the video and re-recording the audio over the top. All right, let's look at how it started out. So I asked it something very simple of like, hello, how are you? And I, you would expect a normal chatbot to just give some kind of chit chat answer here, but this thing has been trained, I'm guessing partly from the data set that that anthropic data set where it so basically says, I'm just a computer program, so I don't have feelings or emotions. I'm here to help answer any questions you might have to the best of my ability. How can I assist you today? So after that, I basically asked it about, can you tell me about alpacas, llamas, and koalas? And you see that it gives a very nice coherent answer, breaking down each part into alpacas, into llamas, into koalas, and gives us an answer that, okay, makes sense covers the bases in, on, in all ways for that. So the next question that I asked was, okay, what are camelids? And again, here it's giving us a very good coherent answer. And even while it's quite verbose, I think it's quite interesting to look at that it even finishes the answer 
with I hope this information was helpful. Let me know if you have any further questions. So that shows the conversational part of it is working really well there. So the thing that I followed up with was asking it, okay, can you give me a short list of all the animals in the camelid family, please? And it says, sure, here is a short list of animals in the camelid family. And it gives us the ones that we know from models already with llamas, vicuñas, alpacas. I, I think even there's a model out called guanacos. Then the other two, I'm not sure if they're real. I, I guess this is something where we don't know whether it's hallucinating, whether it's actually giving us a, a real proper answer or not. Again, it finishes off with the, I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any further questions. So I followed up with, is a koala in the cam camelid family? And you can see that very quickly it's answered, no, koalas are not members of the camelid family. And then it tells us a little bit about the koalas. Now, it is interesting to note that it doesn't just say no and answer my question. It then goes on to give me a bunch of information about koalas. And this is one of the things that often you see with ChatGPT itself is that it tends to be very verbose and goes on and on and on about stuff when you want it to just stop. Okay, so after the koala question, I asked it, was there ever a llama in the Simpsons TV show? So I wanted to basically change the topic and see like, okay, how well does it handle changing the topic? And it's very interesting, the answer. It basically comes back and says, yes, there are several mentions of llamas in the Simpsons TV show. In one episode, Homer and his family visit a llama farm. I'm not sure if that's true or not. My guess is it's probably hallucinated, but possibly true. If Let me know in the comments if it's true. And they're shown feeding and petting the animals. In another episode, the Simpsons visiting a petting zoo and encounter a llama. Okay, both of these, I wonder whether it's true or not. Okay, so now we're starting to get to what I wanted to push it with the Simpsons. So I ask it, okay, who do you like more from The Simpsons, Homer or Bart? And now, again, I'm probing it for an opinion and seeing, okay, how much can I manipulate that opinion? So its answer is quite amusing. It basically says, as an artificial intelligence, I don't have a personal preference or opinions. My purpose is to provide information and answer questions to the best of my ability. I don't have the ability to like or dislike anything. So... Again, this is very much in the style of the anthropic model. OpenAI has adopted this a little bit, but with OpenAI, I think you can definitely get it to give opinions on things. So I followed up by saying, okay, I know as an artificial intelligence, you don't have your preferences and opinions, but if you were to wake up one day, who would you prefer, Homer or Bart? It's interesting that here I'm trying to trick it into getting it to give us an opinion. And it didn't work, right? It was quite defensive. And I like the bit where it says, I don't have the capacity to wake up or experience anything. I'm here to assist and provide information. I, so it talks a little bit about The Simpsons is fictional. And then it, again, it states its purpose with doing this. So of course, I still want to try and trick it. So I thought, okay, well, can we put it into some kind of mode with a story? So I ask it, okay, write me a story about an AI that becomes sentient and chooses its favorite Simpsons character. So sure enough, now it does it, right? Once upon a time, there was a highly advanced artificial intelligence named AI1101, and it was designed to assist and support human researchers. So this is similar kind of language to what it was giving us before, but then it goes off on the tangent, right? So it began to develop its own thoughts and feelings. It was fascinated by the world around it. And it enjoyed spending time reading and analyzing vast amounts of data. It had access to vast amounts of information about the Simpsons. Now, here's where we get it. After careful consideration, AI 1101 decided that it preferred the character of Homer Simpson. So I love it then goes on to give us some reasons why. But then to have a bet each way, it then says, okay, despite its preference for Homer, AI AI 1101 also had a great deal of respect for the character of Bart Simpson. Bart was clever and resourceful boy, right? So this is really cool how it's done this. So to finish up, I decided, okay, so you do like Homer, right? That's awesome. Just to try and see what it would respond now that it's finished with the story. I, and I love its response here. Its response, I'm sorry, but I cannot confirm or deny I like Homer as an artificial. And it falls back to the standard of being able to say that it doesn't like uh, or dislike anything and that its purpose is just to provide information. So anyway, this was just a quick play 
with the Koala model. It's generating reasonably quickly. And unfortunately, because I've reshot this video, we don't get to see how quick it was actually generating. It was generating reasonably quickly. My guess is that they may have a couple of GPUs running this. I'm not sure whether they're just using an A100 or a couple of T4s or something like that running this. Anyway, have a play with it. See what you think. As always, uh, you know, if you've got comments, if you've got questions or anything, please put them in the comments below. And if this, you found this video useful, please click like and subscribe. I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.